behalf of Sages Diagnostics, I want to welcome those of you who are returning for our fourth, uh, our third rather, Durham Path Happy Hour. And uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, I would ask that everybody please go ahead and mute. Uh, and um, I'm going to open my chat room here. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll try and uh, pay attention to that. If you have any uh, feedback you want to give us, please uh, feel free to contact the education link uh, that you can us on your email uh, for Sages Diagnostics, or you can uh, email me directly at uh, tdavis at uh, sagesdx.com or uh, text or call me. Uh, my cell phone is 210-416. Uh, 4815. Looks so like my screen sharing stopped. So let me see if I can get that going again. Uh, if you guys will bear with me, I think I'm just going to log off and log back on. Let me see if I can get that going. Okay. There we go. Okay, it looks like it's uh, back up again. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first slide was a uh, shade biopsy. Uh, this is from sun damage skin of the head or neck. And uh, one can see, uh, and I'm going to use my uh, pencil here, a centrally located cystic cavity. And um, as we move in to higher power, and take a look at this cystic cavity, one can see uh, rather pronounced evidence of acantholysis. And in addition to acantholysis, there are uh, scattered dyskeratotic cells that you can see. These uh, dyskeratotic cells have nuclei that are round to oval. Some of them are a little bit hyperchromatic, abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm. Uh, there are these strands and cords of follicular epithelium extending out into the stroma, some of them interconnected. But of note, there is a lack of cytologic atypia of the keratinocytes comprising this region. Uh, and that's important to note. Uh, as we mentioned last week when we were looking at Haley Haley disease and um, uh, Derrier's disease, Acanthalytic dyskeratosis can occur in a number of conditions. And when that change occurs in a cyst or in a hair follicle, uh, the, the, the uh, diagnosis of, is a woody dyskeratoma. And so this is a, a real nice example of a woody dyskeratoma. Uh, the item that I'll try and trip you up with on boards is an acanthalytic squamous cell carcinoma. That tumor can also show acanthalysis of dyskeratosis, uh, but unlike a woody dyskeratoma, it'll be characterized by uh, quite a bit more cytologic atypia. So again, one of the take-home points of this slide is that a woody dyskeratoma is nothing more than that change of acanthalysis and dyskeratosis, or acanthalytic dyskeratosis, occurring in a cyst, a follicle, or occasionally, uh, in a ductal structure. Woody dyskeratomas have been reported to occur uh, in the oral mucosa, and there are uh, no hair follicles there. So in that instance, it's the change of uh, FAD or focal acanthalytic dyskeratosis involving a, uh, a salivary gland. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to slide two. Slide two was a uh, very skinny punch biopsy. This is from the, uh, probably from the, the uh, trunk or proximal extremity. The dermis is relatively uh, thick. And uh, one can see within the dermis a superficial 
perivascular and interstitial infiltrate that uh, contains lymphocytes uh, and numerous extravasated erythrocytes. And anytime you see uh, a lot of extravasated erythrocytes within the nerves, you want to make sure you hone in on the vascular integrity uh, to make sure that that is intact. If we move to higher power, we can see that the, the infiltrate is not only perivascular, it's a little bit interstitial. And when you do see an interstitial component to a perivascular dermatitis, nine times out of 10, the infiltrate is going to be missed. Uh, moving to higher power, uh, one can see that in addition to lymphocytes, there are extravasated erythrocytes. In addition, uh, there are a few scattered neutrophils. I'll go ahead and circle them with my uh, pencil here. And some neutrophilic nuclear dust. To rework here. <clears throat> and in addition, there's fibrin deposited in the uh, vessel walls. And uh, so this is an example of leukocytoplastic vasculitis. And again, in order to make that diagnosis, we really like to see the presence of fibrin in vessel walls or lumina in concert with neutrophils and neutrophilic nuclear dust. Now, sometimes in very early leukocytoplastic vasculitis, you'll see a mixed cell lymphotrate dominated by neutrophils and neutrophilic nuclear dust. Uh, but you won't always see <clears throat> in very early lesions a lot of fibrin deposition. So these lesions do kind of change over time. The other thing that you'll sometimes see in um, late lesions of leukocytoplastic vasculitis uh, is more epidermal necrosis. And sometimes eosinophils will uh, enter the infiltrate as well too, and they kind of uh, are involved in the cleanup process. So this is an example of a leukocytoplastic vasculitis. Slide three, and I'm gonna go ahead and rotate the slide, is a horse of a different color. Obviously, this is uh, uh, a large punch biopsy from a neoplastic process that has a uh, uh, fairly sh sharply circumscribed border. There, you know, there's a little intercalation here of neoplastic cells within the uh, uh, dermis with collagen bubbles. This has a deciding, decidedly dumbbell-like configuration, and there's quite a bit of pigment uh, present within the neoplasm as well. Now, if you just had the um, top piece here, let's say we didn't have these dumbbell configurations uh, beneath the line, you could think about the possibility of a sclerosing meningioma variant of a dermatofibroma, because sometimes you can get abundant hemosiderin within those lesions and it can look, uh, can uh, produce an appearance very, very similar. And, you know, there's almost even hand to collagen trapping uh, out of the periphery. But, uh, and again, I wanted to, to uh, reconfigure it to get rid of my lines. Um, this bulbous uh, appearance with these extensions down into the subcutaneous tissue is, is very characteristic of a, a blue nevus and in particular, a save of the And if we move to higher power, uh, we can see fairly plump melanocytes here. Most of them have a vesicular chromatin pattern and kind of inconspicuous nucleoli. There's abundant melanin pigment within uh, macrophages and within some of the uh, uh, neoplastic melanocytes. But while these uh, Melanocytes and nuclei that are slightly pleomorphic. Uh, there are really no discernible uh, mitotic figures or apoptotic cells, not an appreciable inflammatory uh, infiltrate. And uh, again, this is a cellular blue nevus. Probably a better term for this particular tumor would be a spindled and fascicular um, nevus, blue nevus, because the cells have spindled or fusiform shapes, and they're arranged in vascles. And indeed, the, the term cellular blue nevus makes it sound like any other blue nevus uh, doesn't have cells. So this is a, a nice example of a, a cellular blue nevus. These occur commonly on or around the buttock, uh, and usually very, very dark or pigmented. Moving on to slide four. 
Uh, slide four is a, a punch biopsy. One can see within the dermis uh, a superficial and deep perivascular and interstitial infiltrate. Uh, this infiltrate has a, a decidedly nodular quality. And I think, um, as we've discussed before, even at scanning magnification, you, know, you can see that there's some, uh, probably some lymphoid cells here. These cells have um, small dark nuclei and no clearly discernible cytoplasm. But if you look at the dermis elsewhere, you can see that the majority of the cells comprising the simple trait are a little bit larger uh, and they're lighter staining, indicating that they probably have a lower nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. In other words, they have, they have more cytoplasm. Uh, the epidermis appears uninvolved. And as we move to higher power, uh, we can see that these uh, cells have uh, round to oval nuclei and fairly abundant uh, pink to slightly uh, clear staining cytoplasm. The uh, cells are arranged interstitially between collagen bundles, and in some areas, there's a slight increase in the amount of mucin uh, present between the uh, collagen bundles. Uh, and this is an example of GA. Uh, granular manulary uh, can occur in a couple of different forms. Actually, you can, you can get subcutaneous GA, but uh, typical GA when it involves the dermis can give you either a uh, distinctive palisade where the histiocytes are arranged around collagen bundles that are separated from one another by mucin. Or you can get an interstitial variant where um, you just get the histiocytes present between collagen bundles without a true palisade. A lot of times you'll get a mixed picture. Uh, some, and in a given biopsy, you might see a clear cut palisade, and in another area, just the histiocytes located interstitially between collagen bundles. GA doesn't scar uh, unlike NLB, so um, the collagen bundles in GA are not really degenerated, they're just separated from one of them uh, by mucin. So this is a, a pretty classic example of GA. GA is in that group of disorders that gives you a, a busy, dizzy dermis look, kind of a hypersaver dermis. And on scan, when you see that, that appearance where it looks like there are a lot of cells uh, present interstitially within the dermis, you know, you need to think about GA. You, you should think about a blue nevus. Uh, you should think about KS, Kaposi sarcoma. You should think about metastatic carcinoma. Uh, and uh, those are some of the things that uh, enter into the uh, differential of kind of a busy, busy nervous. Moving on to slide five. Slide five was also an inflammatory condition. This is kind of interesting because we've got this, this punch biopsy, uh, probably from near acral skin. And I say that because the uh, quantified layer is slightly thickened by compact uh, hyperkeratosis, and there are really no um, discernible follicular units within the dermis. And what's striking about this particular um, a biopsy is a couple of things. You know, we've got this superficial and deep uh, perivascular infiltrate, but the infiltrate here is kind of decidedly bottom heavy, which is unusual for a uh, superficial and deep infiltrate. You know, nine times out of 10, when you see that the infiltrate tends to be more top heavy. And so when we see a bottom heavy uh, lymphoid infiltrate like this, I mean, some of the things that, that I tend to think about are um, lymphoma or uh, connective tissue disease, specifically lupus, uh, or uh, even things like perniosis. Uh, and if we if we take a look at higher power again, we've got a little bit of epidermal hyperplasia. As we uh, move into the papillary dermis, we can see there's papillary dermal edema, but there's real really no vacuolar alteration along the dermal epidermal junction. Furthermore, uh, the epidermis has retention of the normal reedy ridge pattern. You know, a lot of times in connective tissue disease lupus, the epidermis gets thin with the basement of the reedy ridge pattern. Uh, and we see 
that in concert with bacchiolar alteration, and we really don't uh, have that here. The infiltrate lymphodermis is lymphocytic, and again, it's uh, pretty uh, dense and deep and preferentially located around uh, the eccrine coils in the underlying subcutaneous tissue and around the, uh, the deeper vessels. And this was an example of uh, perniosis. Um, and again, uh, perniosis typically gives you a superficial and deep perivascular lymphoid infiltrate, frequent papillary dermal edema. It's frequently bottom heavy. And sometimes you will see the so-called fluffy edema uh, within vessels where uh, the uh, wall gets somewhat indistinct in their clear standing spaces around the uh, vessels. I, I didn't think it was so pronounced here, uh, but I just wanted to show you an example of uh, perniosis. Slide six is a, a much smaller biopsy specimen. This is a punch biopsy. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a fair, fairly high concentration of follicular units here. They're kind of small and bellous. Um, another clue to location on the face here is the presence of skeletal muscle. And remember the muscles of mimetic expression on the face insert into the dermis. So it's one of the few uh, areas, uh, face and neck, the platysma, where you're actually going to see skeletal muscle extending into the dermis. And, uh, you know, I think uh, very, it became very readily apparent that this was a uh, deposition disorder. And uh, this particular deposit, of course, has a very characteristic histologic appearance. We've got these ochre colored banana shaped fibers present within the dermis. And this, of course, is. Uh, Ochronosis. This was a case of exogenous ochronosis uh, due to application of hydroquinone, and it's you know such a very distinctive deposit that you know you you either you either know it or you don't know. It. Once you've seen one case, you see them all. But uh, you hope to get a slide like that on your boards. That's kind of idea. Slide seven is a uh, punch biopsy from the trunk. And it brings us back to uh, consideration of a differential that we actually discussed uh, last week. So if we look at the pattern here, uh, we've got a superficial and deep perivascular infiltrate occurring in concert with epidermal hyperplasia. And within the papillary dermis, a lichenoid infiltrate that kind of obscures the dermal epidermal junction. So we've got psoriasis form lichenoid dermatitis. And you'll remember last week we discussed the that when you see this pattern, three things you need to think of right away are lichen striatus, secondary syphilis, and uh, mycosis fungoides. And if we take a look at the, uh, the infiltrate, even at this power, uh, we can see that there are for sure lymphoid cells uh, present within the infiltrate, but you know, the, the infiltrate has a, a vaguely granulomatous appearance here. If we, if we take a look at some of these cells, uh, we see that the, uh, uh, the cytoplasm is much more pink. These have much more cytoplasm, a little bit more of a histiocytic appearance. So, so this is psoriasis from lichenoid, but it's, it's clearly got a little bit of a granulomatous pattern. If you take a look at the reading, they're kind of elongated, thinly tapered, and uh, as you move to higher power and uh, start looking at the infiltrate, you see uh, lymphocytes, you see histiocytes, and then you begin to see scattered throughout the infiltrate, although granted not in high number plasma cells. And uh, once you start seeing one, you can begin to see uh, a few more. So we've got psoriasis form lichenoid with a decidedly granulomatous appearance, the, the thin 3D and a few scattered plasma cells. So this is an example of a secondary syphilis. And I, I can almost guarantee you on your board, you're gonna, you're gonna have a biopsy of secondary syphilis. It's just something that they want you to be able to recognize. They're probably gonna give you one 
that has a few more plasma cells uh, than this particular uh, uh, example. So look for plasma cells. Sometimes they're easier to see around vessels of the uh, superficial or mid-dermal plexus rather than in the dense infiltrate that's hugging the uh, dermal epidermal junction. So secondary syphilis, I would definitely recognize it. Slide eight uh, is a shade biopsy. The slide was scanned uh, at slightly higher power, so it's you know already it looks a little bigger than it is. This would be analogous to probably 10x uh, on a microscope, and um, we've got an epithelial neoplasm uh, rather than a mesenchymal neoplasm. And what's uh, distinctive about this particular tumor is we get this abrupt transition from stratified squamous uh, epithelium of the epidermis to more pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It's a pretty abrupt transition. Uh, furthermore, uh, the neoplasm is forming these elongated tubular structures that extend down into the dermis. There is uh, some evidence of decapitation secretion. So this is clearly showing African differentiation with the decapitation secretion and the elongated branching tubules. And then, of course, the uh, key to uh, the correct diagnosis rests in the recognition of plasma cells here uh, within the stroma of these papillary projections. And this is a syringocyst adenoma papilla from these, uh, as, as you all know, frequently occur in the setting of an even sebaceous, uh, but occasionally they'll just arise de novo as a crusted papule on the scalp, or uh, occasionally they can even occur within an epidermal nucleus. So these are African tumors, and what you look for is that, uh, that, that one, are connected to the epidermis. Two, you look for that abrupt transition from stratified squamous epithelium to glandular epithelium, and of course the plasma cells within the stroma. There's a lot of similarity to a hydratinoma another type of African tumor. Those tumors are the ones that have a maze-like configuration. And while they have elongated branching tubules and decapitation secretion, they're not connected to the overlying epidermis and they lack uh, the uh, plasma cell rich infiltrate within the stroma, within the uh, papillary projections. And those are the lesions that, that occur with greatest frequency in the general region of women. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide nine. Slide nine is a very superficial shade biopsy. Uh, this biopsy is from an April surface. You can see a, a thickened stratum corneum here. And, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of inflammation. Uh, but the epidermis is transected uh, at its base. And as we move to higher power, you can see that there are some uh, holes present within the stratum corneum. And if we move into higher power and look in the stratum corneum in the vicinity of these holes, one can begin to see uh, pigmented septate hypal elements. These are clearly brown, easily discernible. And this was an example of tinea nigra. And uh, it's another favorite board question because the organism's fairly easy to see. It usually doesn't induce uh, much in the way of an inflammatory response. And one of the clues that's been written about to the diagnosis of tinea nigra is the presence of these, these holes within the stratum corneum. And of course, um, Especially, we, we tend to see more biopsies, not from dermatologists, but from primary care physicians who are, who are concerned about April melanoma or an April melanocytic neoplasm. So this is an example of tinea nigra. Moving on to slide 10. Slide 10 is a shade biopsy. And one can see a fairly brisk inflammatory infiltrate within the dermis. Obviously, the most striking change is within the epidermis. And one can see a very large intraepidermal vesicle here within the epidermis. 
uh, there may be some evidence of re-epithelialization here. And you remember um, when we uh, met last week, we talked about the fact that when uh, you assess an intraepidermal vesicular dermatitis, one of the, the crucial determinants is how this blister formed. And while there may be some spongiosis here, um, I think it's pretty obvious that this blister has mainly formed as the consequence of ballooning. These uh, keratinocytes have uh, accumulated so much intracellular edema that just exploded. Uh, the nuclei are gone, these cells are necrotic, and we're getting a coalescence of cell membranes to, to form these, uh, this reticular network. This is reticular alteration. And when you see extensive ballooning like this, two broad categories that you want to think of are nutritional deficiency disorders. I've never seen this much ballooning in a nutritional deficiency disorder, and uh, uh, viral abscesses. Now, there's certainly no evidence here of a herpes virus infection. Uh, there's no evidence of peripheral, peripheral origination of the nucleoplasm. Uh, there are no multinucleated keratinocytes. There may be within uh, some of these cells a little di bit difficult to appreciate, maybe a, an occasional small uh, viral inclusion. But within the underlying dermis, there's a mixed cell infiltrate that contains lymphocytes and numerous eosinophils and some papillary dermal edema. And this constellation of features is, is uh, highly, highly suggestive uh, of this condition. This is a uh, parapox virus infection. This is ORF. And ORF and Milker's nodules can show very similar changes. And the, the histology is kind of variable depending on when during the course of the infection uh, the lesions biopsy. You know, early on, you can get a lot of papillomatosis, and then the lesions begin to fasciculate, and then later on, they'll become fibrotic with very elongated reading. But, uh, you know, one of the take on points here is, you know, when you see extensive intraepidermal uh, vesicle formation uh, as the result of ballooning, you really need to think about viral infections. And this mixed cell infiltrate is kind of characteristic of. of uh, or as well too, but it doesn't have the distinctive cytopathic changes that we see, let's say, in a uh, herpes virus. Uh, moving on to slide 11, uh, we're back in the land of epithelial tumors. And again, one point that we've made before is most epithelial tumors in the skin do show uh, adnexal differentiation. So um, when we see an epithelial tumor, you know, the decision mainly becomes is, is it follicular, or sebaceous, equine, or apocrine. But this is a very distinctive tumor. Hopefully most of you had no problem with this. Uh, and we can see a centrally located uh, dilated follicular infundibulum. And then emanating from the wall of the infundibulum, several really well-developed secondary hair follicles. I mean, this, this hair follicle is so well differentiated that uh, it's got uh, trichal hyaline granules and even a little hair bowl. And then we've got a couple of other real well differentiated secondary hair follicles here. And the, these hair follicles are so well differentiated, they're capable of making hair shafts. And that's why in this particular tumor, sometimes you'll see tufts of um, uh, white hairs uh, extending from the lumina. Very prominent fibrotic stroma. And again, look at the uh, degree of differentiation in these uh, secondary hair follicles. And this, of course, is a uh, trichal folliculoma. Differs from a pilochipe canthoma, which can have a similar configuration by the fact that in this particular tumor, trichal folliculoma, the secondary hair follicles are much more well differentiated and not quite as acanthotic as one sees in a uh, pilar shaped anthoma. But that's that's kind of the differential. And they might throw uh, a fibro folliculoma on the differential as well too. But a fibro folliculoma almost always occurs in association with a trichodiscoma. So you've got a uh, skinny distorted hair follicle and then a lot of fibroblasts and a mixed weight stroma. I think, you know, I think they would put that on there mainly because of the similarity of the name rather than histological appearance. So beautiful here, uh, trichofloculoma. 
And then the uh, last slide that we have, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, and rotate the slide here, is uh, another, you know, some people regard this as as reactive, some as neoplastic, but um, we've got another neoplastic process. And uh, this is uh, situated in the subcutaneous tissue. And this is mesenchymal. It's not epithelial. Fairly sharply circumscribed, although you can see in the top piece, it's partially sampled. And one can appreciate, even at scanning magnification, there are both hypo and hypercellular areas. And then if we move to higher power, we can see embedded within an extremely mixoid stroma, uh, a proliferation of uniform spindle cells. Now, some of these are kind of plump and stellate with prominent nucleoli. There are a few mitotic figures, but they're normal in appearance. Um, you, could, the, you know, the cells are not really forming fascicles. They're more separated from one another. There are a lot of extravasated erythrocytes, and there uh, is an admixture of inflammatory cells. There's some uh, lymphocytes and a few scattered neutrophils. And these fibroblasts have been likened to, uh, or spindle cells have been likened to fibroblast and tissue culture. And if you've ever looked at a tissue culture of fibroblasts with a dissecting scope, this is kind of what the cells look like. This is an example of early nodular fasciitis. Um, nodular fa fasciitis uh, is characterized by um, the presence of rapidly growing nodules. And while it frequently occurs in, in the fascia uh, overlying skeletal muscle, it can also arise in the fibrous septi. Uh, and this, is, this particular variant of nodular fasciitis, this particular lesion, is centered in the fat. And rarely it can arise in the drums. But uh, what one see, and, and dermato as a dermatologist, you, know, you, you, you may very well biopsy a lesion like this. A lot of times they're submitted as lipomas or, or they're felt to be rapidly enlarging cysts. So it's important to be able to recognize. But again, the features that one sees uh, are plump stellate fibroblast, mixoid stroma, extravasated erythrocytes, and an inflammatory infiltrate of neutrophils and lymphocytes without a whole lot of cytologic activity. So this is an example of uh, nodular fasciitis. And uh, certainly appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, if you have any questions about these cases or if you have any feedback, uh, please feel free to, to uh, sign on to the, to the educational um, link or um, go ahead and um, email me directly. And uh, I appreciate every bit of attention. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.